wow, you're, you're taking it very hard. Like, you know, there was two of you and I don't think you did that many things wrong. And, and I, you know, I don't, why are you being so hard on yourself? I'm like, it's not that I'm being hard on myself. It's that I'm now only responsible for myself. And without being responsible for her as part of the, the team, I have to dissect how I got here. It doesn't matter if I did something right or if I did something wrong. What matters is how did I get here? Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mark Rose Podcast. Today, I'm excited to have founder, creative, podcaster, writer, entrepreneur, all the things, Matt Gottesman. Welcome. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me on. I'm so excited to be connected to you. And what brought us together was my friend, Brandon Collingsworth, sending me your words. He had shared it in a men's group that I'm in. I was just so struck by them. And I, I want to read them just so people have some context of why I was like, I got to meet this guy. Your purpose is not uncertain. You are. Don't let the human in you talk you out of the soul in you. And I love that. I mean, the people who are consistent listeners of the podcast heard me talk about it on an episode because I was just so struck by how much our humanness actually talks us out of the brilliance of our soul, which is such a beautiful thing, but almost like a beautiful tragedy in a way. So yeah, where was this inspired from? A lot of things. I mean, you know, you're on the journey as well. And you, we know what we know, what we know, we know, we know at our soul level, we know. And why don't we always trust that? What is that relationship like? And I'd found that it's a practice. What happened, somebody had asked me on, I think it was like an Instagram live or a Zoom call or something. And they said, how do you know if it's God, your intuition and God, or if it's fear? And I said, well, if it's God or my intuition, it's instant. I know. I just know. You can feel it. You ask, you receive, you know. And I was like, and be careful because usually that question you ask, the answer is usually maybe the opposite of what you were hoping for. Isn't that the truth? Right? There's everything around us always that are tempting us of like, oh, I want that deal. Or for some people, I want to date that person. They, they want it now, you know? And they said, okay, well, how do you know if it's fear? And I said, when I try to negotiate with God, when I try to negotiate with myself, I try to make it so. I try to make it, I try to fit it in or I try to have this discussion well. I could justify it this way. And it's like, you're trying to make something fit versus just a knowing. And they said, this guy asked, he goes, okay, how the hell do you decide? <laughs> you know, like, how do you trust what you hear? And I said, that's actually a really great question. And I said, it's practice. I said, what happens is I hear it and I don't always follow it. And you have to have the grace sometimes to test it, to practice it. Sometimes I follow it immediately, and I'm so glad I did. And other times, if I decide to go test the theory, <laughs> if you will, if I want to test the hypothesis, like, did I hear that correct? Take one step to the left. Just take one step in the opposite direction and be self-aware. How does it feel when it's happening? Does it feel right? Like, be just really in it. Like, almost use you as the experiment, right? Be like, all right, you know, this, mm, it's you know, this feels okay. Maybe it might work. Let's see how this works. And then let's take another step and another step. At each step, you're just being very self-aware and observant. And because you know what you know, you probably do know the entire time it's happening, but at least you're checking in. And the moment you realize, hopefully not too far away, but the moment you realize, you know what, this isn't aligned with me, you can instantly make one turn to the right and you're right back to God, your intuition to yourself. That's the beauty of it. We can go really far out and really mess up, but one turn to the right and we're right back to where you know we know to be. So I think that's kind of the beauty in testing and practicing. But that's what happened. It was and then I I was I was reflecting and I write a lot. And it was we know our purpose a lot of times when we really try to ask that question and try to sit with ourselves, which is very hard for a lot of people to do, all of us at any time. So we start to do it and we start to have this relationship with ourselves. And you can feel it. And I feel that it's aligned. Like it's downstream. It's very when we're aligned with it and we do our things within our purpose, why does there feel like so much ease? Yeah, and when we don't, why does there feel like so much resistance? And I think that's when we're uncertain, but our purpose is not. Our purpose is like, no, you know, let me lead you, right? So that was kind of where that, that derived from. And, I, and I'll kind of just circle back on one thing on that. It was just that your soul and your body have to work together. So your soul is inhabiting the vessel and the vessel has to move the soul. The soul is like, I'm your GPS. I'm going to tell you exactly where you need to go. 
And the body's like, nah, I like this. <laughs> you know, I feel this. I want this. I'm addicted to this. I need to have this, whatever it might be, right? The physicality of the physical world. But the two actually have to align because if the body's like, I'll surrender to the soul and the soul's like, I'll guide you. And then mm. we just follow within our purpose and we're, we're more likely to see the outcomes that are for us, but we have to really surrender to that, right? So that's where a lot of that came from. Personal reflection. Yeah, you know, it's such a beautiful articulation of, I think, what somatically or, or we feel, you know, and when you said take a left, you know, I remember having this sense of wanting to end a relationship and it was a very significant relationship. We've been together quite some time and I really stewed on that and like did the research and, you know, important decision. And I'm sure for anyone listening, that could be a decision about any large life, stay or go sort of circumstance, work who we are, you know, how our values, everything. Do I stay in the old behaviors? Do I stay in the old relationship? And what you said about we ask for a message from God, I often joke of like, we ask for one and then we get the answer and we don't like what we hear. So we, what you said, we go into this sort of bargaining, you know, it's almost like the stages of grief, you know, you're like bargaining with the reality of the path that you know, your soul soul is calling you to take. And I, you know, I'm curious your thoughts on this because I remember really owning then, you know, okay, I need to end this relationship. I go have the very hard conversation, but I had been sitting on this feeling for six months, you know, a while. And I have the conversation and in the conversation, I agree to go on a break instead. So not full breakup, just break. Well, I leave the house and my gut is just in chaos because it's like, it was the left, you know, it was like in not wanting to hurt someone's feelings too much, or like maybe tear the bandaid off. I tore it off. And then I put a gauze back on, you know, not knowing how to hold the grief myself or hold rejection. So I didn't know how to sit with someone and let them hold rejection and, and let it be a beautiful process. And I think we only know that when we've navigated rejection from a space of expansion. But yeah, it was interesting, because then when I ended the break, pretty much the next couple of days later, because I realized how, I, why did I make this courageous leap? And then now I'm like half stepping back. I felt so liberated, like so liberated. Honesty is the most liberating thing we can do. And what I love sharing with others and my own personal journey with it is that honesty is the most unconditional loving thing that we can do. If we remove, basically, if I'm unconditionally loving, I'm putting truth above self-interest. You can be with a person who is completely aligned in so many different ways, but they're just something at your soul level is not your life partner. And I've been in this position before and both of us loved each other through it and we amicably split through it. Right. And so, and I think that that's, that's something that like people, I get it. Most people don't like confrontation. Nobody really likes confrontation. Nobody wants to let anybody down. But when loving somebody unconditionally is saying like, you know what, I can't get in the way of what's for you. Something at my gut level is telling me that, you know, we're not the life partners for each other. I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. And I've had that done to me and I've done that to someone. And honestly, it's interesting when you both tap into that feeling and you kind of take a step back, you go, you know, I do at some level kind of feel that. And it's a very interesting process because that's like actually loving each other and saying like, listen, and I've had to say this, like, you're a queen. I wouldn't be dating somebody that I didn't already feel connected to and love because we're here to love, but you're not my queen. And that means that as a man, I have a responsibility to lead as such and not do the thing just because a self-interest wants to be in there, but to actually lead by example and say, listen, if I don't believe I'm your man, then there is one for you and I can't get in the way of that. I think when we lead like that, I found like women have actually looked at me and said, I'm like, wow, that's different. You know, and I had, there was one relationship where she said, is it so black and white? You know? And I said, well, my soul, yeah. I mean, my soul knows, you know, it's back full circle to like, you know, right versus like, like you know, we know. And I said, but are you asking me to, if this process is so black and white, so easy? And she goes, yeah. I'm like, hardest thing I've ever had to do. I was like, you don't think that as a man, I don't have desires. I don't get lonely. Like I go home and I'm like, God, why? Like, this isn't even fair. This isn't even fun anymore. You think saying no to a woman who is spiritual, who's aligned, who has values, who is great, all these things, but just 
there's a couple things there that do feel off at a soul level. You think that that's easy. It's actually one of the hardest things because I'm trying to lead and behave like a leading man that's trying to do the right thing, not one that's just trying to do out of my own self-interest and maybe even guide us down further a road that maybe we're not supposed to be on. And she was like, okay. you know. And I find that women just want men to just give it straight. What are you really, really feeling? There's actually relief for them <laughs> when you do that. They, they look at you to go... Oh yeah, they love you for it. And they they know, they know. You cannot lie or wa be wavering or you cannot, or be kind of, you know, teetering. They know, they can feel it. And they give us a lot of grace because they allow a lot of shit from us if we're not like clear. <laughs> and so it's, so I've, I've learned a lot that like, wow, when I am so direct and so honest, they really, they admire you. And it also brings relief to them and respect to you. But it's relief to them like, I knew it. They're like, they look at you like, I knew it. I like somewhere I kind of knew it, but I didn't want to confirm because I didn't want to be wrong or I didn't want to push you away. You know, all the emotions get in there, but they know. Their intuition is spot on always, I think, if they listen to it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I agree. If it hasn't been disrupted by you know, experience is probably inherited with men in, in relationship, not only men, but, you know, the human experience that disconnects us from the intuition, from the gut. I mean, that's a whole other level of integrity and leadership. And regardless of gender, I think that's fascinating to think of, because I know the first time someone said to me, like, what is truly integrity to you? Because if I'm afraid to tell someone the truth, because I'm afraid to hurt their feelings, I'm actually not leading because I'm letting fear lead. I'm letting, and I also don't trust that they can hold something. Well, I might've robbed them of ever holding it. Like true integrity is, as you said, you, if you place truth at the altar, then love flows. I mean, that's it. Like my fiance now and I, when we were together in a previous relationship, we had to come to the place that you're talking about, which was this is no longer in service of each of us. We don't know why, but the soul is calling. And hers was calling louder and mine was calling louder too, but hers was earlier in the call. And in the departure, which was at the time permanent, it was exactly what both our souls needed. And that level of trust, you know, I, I was writing about this the other day and I was thinking just how when you put staying together ahead of everything, then your relationship becomes a prison and you'll avoid everything that might break you apart. But if you tell the truth, regardless of where it might lead your relationship, you actually lead your relationship if it is meant to be together. You actually lead it in service of love and you liberate it. And like, now this relationship is the place we tell the truth. Like, why is that not the fucking baseline? It's such a, you know, I had an interesting experience with another great woman in my life a couple of years ago. I remember early on in our relationship, we were having a conversation and I was trying to express myself about what I was experiencing. I was having a week. It was a tough week. And I'm, I'm trying to, you know, express myself. And it was funny because she was at the time more in her the, a masculine energy. She's like, oh, go walk it off. <laughs> you know, And I'm like, but I actually wanted to work through it. And, and we both laughed at it later after we dissected it. And I was like, you know what? Let me try this. Drop the mask. Got very clear. And I said, you know what? I'm jealous of you. And she's like, you're jealous. And I said, I'm feeling insecure because you've been so productive this week. You got everything done that you wanted to. And I'm struggling. There's this project I'm working on and there's some missing pieces. And I feel like I didn't execute the way I, I know to execute. So it was, it was more of just like, just being like a jealous of like, you know, when like your best friend does something that, you know, or, or whatever, somebody that's just doing something really well and you're trying to like work through these pieces, right? And she goes, interesting. And I was like, yeah. So that's what I was experiencing. She goes, you know, last week when you had said something, you were talking about this, we were talking about spirituality. And she goes, I was insecure when I said this. And I'm like, really? I was like, why were you insecure? And she goes, you're such a spiritual man. I was feeling like, can I live up to this spiritual person? Am I spiritual enough? And I'm like, you? You're very spiritual. I had no idea. And she goes, yeah, that's how I was feeling. Afterwards, we're laughing most attractive thing ever. We were even more turned on. <laughs> we just looked at each other like, oh my, it's very liberating. Honesty, that's what I said. Honesty is for, it's like foreplay because you're so free. You're so, you feel so free when you're so honest and the space is held on both sides, judgment free. 
especially if you if you know each other's character, it's okay to like express the thing that you're feeling that's not even real. A lot of times it's not even real. You're just working through an emotion or a trigger or or just a bad day or whatever. And so when that space is held and somebody be like, oh, I've had that. Oh, I felt like that. Oh, here, let me relate to you. <sighs> Forget it. That's foreplay, <laughs> you know? So that's very liberating. It's so hot. You know, I'm curious what your thoughts are on, do you think we are, you know, because I think about this, both conflict and synergy, I guess it's a, a sacred tension that exists between biology and soul. And that is that you have biology wants survival, it wants predictability, it wants you know, all the things. It wants dopamine, it wants orgasms, it wants <laughs> it wants needs met now, and it doesn't operate well with fear. You know, you can't both be critically thinking and afraid. And so I'm curious if you think it is, because we go into this space of exploring soul versus biology, and do you think it is the process of us waking up due to inherited wounding that silences us or, or doesn't lay truth at the sacred commitment of relationship, whatever type? Or is it that evolutionarily we never really have because we've been biologically driven and we're actually in the journey of bringing consciousness and soul more to the forefront? Like free will is really now being, because that's like the ultimate level of accountability, the ultimate level of responsibility. So do you think it's one or the other? Or, or does it fucking matter? I don't even know. Maybe the question's moot. I think there's probably... A multitude of answers in there, right? Biology and how we understand how our body and our mind, our whole neurological system is all connected, how we treat our body, what goes in our body, how are we taking care of the, the vessel that houses the soul? So it is able to discern and make choices that, just I should say discern or make choices from a connected state to our soul, to our conscious or subconscious to, you know, the things that we can't see. How do we trust a feeling? The interesting thing, you see this all the time. You see this all the time. People say, I'm just going to do this. Well, why? It just feels right. Most people freak out when they hear somebody say that for probably a lot of reasons. Uh, one, because they're having a different journey. And two, a feeling, no, no, no I need data. And the body collects data. And, you know, Dr. Do you have a graph? Do you have a graph right, right, right. on the feeling? Uh, actually, How right many here. times it's worked out? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and Dr. Joe talks, right, Dispenza talks a little bit about this. I love science meets spirituality. So, like, I love the two working together. And the body, it's, it's very interesting, right? Most people, they hear you going to go do something. Now, first of all, they've got their own triggers of like, oh, that won't work. That didn't work for you. In fact, I could also understand why it might not have, because that might not even be your path, your soul's path. So I already can't really listen per se to your advice. Now, interestingly enough, people who are normally used to taking risks and being good and comfortable with the unknown, the uncertain, notice what they say to you if you tell them you're going to go do something. You're like, let me know how that goes and try that out and see what happens. And I understand what you're feeling. They've done it. Most people who are used to taking risks with the uncertainty of life, like, so you see this with a lot of entrepreneurs, right? They've done that. And I found that most people I get advice from, they're like, they don't give you answers. They don't criticize. They're like, they might even give you some extra, like, hey, watch out for this, this, and this, but you should go for that. And so I find that biologically, the body is used to data. And most people are used to data. I do something and this is what happens. Well, that happened in that moment. That doesn't mean that it's always going to happen that way which we're probably seeing being played out in the macro really much right now, but we won't get there. We'll go there. And so a feeling is, is gut, which so we go back and forth between gut instincts from the soul, gut health from the body, healthy gut, healthy decisions, healthy trust with our intuition. That's why I feel like they really need each other. You know, listen, thousands of years ago, I think we're actually circling back. And in some ways, uh, thousands of years ago, there was a very, right, they were very spiritual, they're very evolved, they had much better food <laughs> because they weren't eating all the way more nutrient dense. Yeah. Right. And so they, I think they were, and they had a lot more ritualistic, you know, uh, spiritual evolution going on, you know? So I almost feel like we're kind of coming back, but using modern times to actually connect globally faster than we ever have before, because that never existed in previous times. So I think it's both. I think they, I think they feed off of each other, but the real data comes from the doing, not from everybody else's like numbers and their path. And I think that, and we have to be very careful with the data from doing, because it's like, this happened in this moment, but how do I feel? It still feels right. I want to trust myself to keep going. Or 
okay, that was interesting. Let me adjust and pivot. And that's why living moment to moment using the, the guidance system, I think really works out well. I think of building trust with her intuition. It's the first major one where I was coming back. This was in my late 20s. I had left it. You know, I had made decisions to live a normal life that checks all the fucking boxes and got me at least no criticism, maybe a little, you know, like you're not criticized, but you're not necessarily celebrated, but people leave you alone. And that's ultimately, we want to sort of meet the expectations of our family, our culture, our religion, our society. And so it's, it was the leaving of that relationship that was the reclamation of trusting the feeling that I had a really beautiful, amazing, incredible human to choose. And I didn't want to choose her and I didn't know why. And that was in total conflict with the story. And so when I made that choice, I felt that there was a coming back to soul, like a coming, oh, I can actually, I remember my sister saying to me, the more you trust the call or whatever the message is you're getting, the more it is trustworthy. Like the more you relate to it, the more you can relate to it. And then, and so I think a lot of when we, when we actually get back into that relationship and embracing whatever our gut quote unquote is telling us, there is an aligning that reoccurs, you know, like a coming back home to ourselves. Once you're in the space of alignment, which I really think, and I'm curious your thoughts, cause I know you use the word integrity. To me, integrity is being in alignment with that at all costs, like to be in alignment with our values and to be out of integrity, which is a natural deviation to discover what integrity means and what values are. Once you're home, once you're in uh, what Brandon Collingsworth, I, I've really liked, he's been giving this language to that feeling, the God pocket, he calls it. And it kind of reminds me like as a quarterback, you're like in the pocket, you know, and once you're in that place, You'll never want to leave it again, although you will by accident and you'll be drawn towards things. You come back again and you feel the exhale. I think once you get there too, your physiology exhales and then your body can then go into that state of healing. So it's almost like sacred return to the call of the soul is also alignment of the body, which allows the body to heal and grow. And then it opens the channel up for more conversation, more thought, more intuition. What do you think? I think it's spot on. And I think the more I live there, the less I leave there. And I make that distinction because you made a really good point. We experience that, maybe the first time we experience it, and the human in us, the humanness, again, you know, can deviate. It happens. And I think we can be very hard on ourselves. I have found, though, do it more than once, twice, three times, you start to get addicted to being home and in touch with yourself so much that the moment you're out of it, you're like, no, 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 no. You know what? I'm going to go take a time out. I'm going to take a time out for myself. And like we, we put ourselves in time out to be like, let me get back to you on that. Or I need to put a pause or whatever it is, right? Because we know how good this feels. And if you achieve it once, you can achieve it again and again. And eventually it can be a place you just live all the time. And to your point, like where then we're always connected, we heal internally and externally, right? You know, the body keeps the score as the book goes, right? So not just from what we put into it, but also how we behave and how we move within our values and how we connect. And when we do this, we're, it's very healing and it feels so naturally high. We don't really need anything else. And so if we deviate, we're like, no, 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 I don't need anything. Like, and I don't want to deviate either because this just feels right. And we have to practice staying there. So that it's like, it's work to get there, probably twice as much to stay there, right? Like anything good in our life. Cause we have to always kind of stay in that presence of it, of anything good that we want to nurture. And I love that you said too, like you don't need the things. So like the addictions fall away because really addictions treat the pain of dissonance of knowing potential and not living it. So it's like a, I think of every addiction I've had or, or still continue to sort of dance with. I always know there's something that lives in what it's covering that I actually need the medicine to, which is really, it's a strange paradox, you know, to know to like when I quit alcohol, just because I was feeling it, that soul was like, you got to. And I was listening to something from Paul Selig, a channel text from his and he had this line where it said, it's like being a fish who learns about the ocean, but lives in an aquarium and then goes to the ocean and then gets that feeling and then goes back to the aquarium and pretends they don't know about the ocean. And I was like, 
That's so the human experience. But I think that first, like what has been your experience and observation in the work that you do, the mentoring and all that stuff in terms of that first leap, like the first leap back into the hands of, into the God pocket, I guess, let's say, uh, which probably feels like a beanbag chair, which I have behind me. I'm wondering, yeah, what gets in the way and what do people generally need to hear? Because I'm sure people listening have a thing. I, I'm always on the edge of something that the God pocket's calling me towards. Yeah. So yeah, what do you think? I've always worked for myself all 22 years. But there were moments where I was also on the consulting side as an independent consultant for all things digital. And when I was doing things that were for me, like starting with my first startup, yeah, it was a complete utter blow up, <laughs> if you will. I mean, like, but I learned everything I needed to about technology and humans and leadership and lawsuits and like a lot of different things, you know, and money and but it was so vast and it was such a blow at such a young age that, you know, I'm thinking big, but I wasn't wrong. But I felt like I was wrong because it was such a blow that, you know, we sometimes pull back. Like you were saying, I was thinking of the analogy when you were saying, and then we, I ended up back in the aquarium. And, but that's okay because I needed to rebound too. And so I was doing some consulting up with some of those things. So it did also teach me. And then I was using that with brands and companies around the world. But when I wasn't doing something for myself that just I felt called to, I could feel it every single time. And now some people, their calling is to do what I was doing for those companies, but that wasn't my calling. It was only my rebound, <laughs> if you will, like to kind of, you know, each time I took a risk. And so once I really started going all in on my stuff, which I think also can be a process because, you know, listen, when we're having to make something out of thin air, that can take a little bit of time. What's the 10,000 hours is like just the start. Yeah, like the idea that the work stops, but the work doesn't stop. The work, as you said, the work is to stay in the space, in the alignment. But I will say, you will also have enough as enough point too. Because if you jump into the ocean, jump back into the aquarium, jump into the ocean, jump back into the aquarium, which I think it's okay. Some people, they jump in the ocean and they never made it. They never made it back. And I'm like, good for you. I did a, I <laughs> yeah, did a little. I wasn't that person. Yeah. I want to own all of me. And lengths. Yeah. <laughs> there were seasons. And so knowing that, but I definitely, once you really hit enough is enough, but there's also now experience and you hope also wisdom, depending your, your <laughs> you know, application of the experience, you get to that point where you're like, I trust myself implicitly and I'm going to behave like it and I'm going to be all in in every decision, I'm checking in soulfully what's going on so I can maneuver about, you know, the world and stay in integrity and stay in integrity to myself too. And in trusting myself and trusting yourself is a process again, like that kind of, you know, well, I'm going to go test this out versus what my soul says. And so I think it's a dance, but once we're all in on ourselves, oh, like and to your point, that's home. That feels so good and home. And I'm like, no, enough's enough. No one's taking me out of my home. But I also recognize the ongoing work to make sure that I don't get lazy where somebody just the right like distraction comes in and be like, oh, wait, 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 look over here. It's like, no, no, no. Stay the course, stay grounded, stay moving, stay in integrity, right? I find those distractions or the things that access us through spaces we just haven't healed yet, you know, and it's like you get called towards, I, I always think of Carolyn Mace talking about the prostitute archetype, but in the context, we think of prostitution, obviously, through like the exchange of sex for money, but prostitution being the archetype of selling out what's important to you for whatever it might be. It doesn't have to be cash. It's often money related, but it could be anything. It could be momentary treating your loneliness. Like it could be anything that is just about pulling you away with a feeling you just don't know how to hold the capacity of. And, and that's how we expand capacity. And then, you know, I think of it from a nervous system perspective, whenever we're leaping into something unknown or making a decision we've never made or changing a pattern, we are inherently in a place of dysregulation, not in a bad way, but in a way that we're almost reprogramming what regulation means. And in order to make leaps like leaving a job or having a conversation or leaving a relationship, we have to be well resourced in that resourcing, like you're talking about spending that time in the aquarium to save money, to find other people who have similar values, who are living similar things, 
then all of a sudden, you know, I think this is why there's such power in story because you see that someone else has done it and you're like, wait, I can do it then. Like that's the path they walked. I can just follow their path and then it becomes my path. And man, I think being a human is, there should be more space to say it's hard. Like it's really fucking hard, especially if your choice is in conflict with the expectation that society, family, religion, all these immensely powerful biological drives that, my God, we'll spend our whole lives selling our own shit out just to keep the love of a toxic person, which is, it's so fucked up to think about because the pain of that, like you said, there'll be a place where you get into so much pain, the leaping back and forth that you get tired of your own bullshit. And then you're like, I can't go back. Again, and then you might, but it's like the shame that can come with that can paralyze us. But that shame is actually, in my opinion, I think that's actually healthy shame because it's asking us to move back into alignment, which is freedom, which is peace. I thought I had understood the quote, when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. I thought I understood it. And then once I really understood it, it was enough. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so like... Like when it wasn't intellectual? Yeah, you know, yeah. When it's so integrated and you're like, no. You've <laughs> really, you've really reached... And, and to your point, the, yeah. there's always layers and there's always new things that come up, mirrors for us. You're right. You know, it can happen any time for sure. I'd found that once the pain of staying the same was much greater than change. And then there's a relationship with what you were saying about the nervous system. I first heard this with Dr. Joe years ago, but because it, it, it dysregulates, like when you pivot and the nervous system's like, no, 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 my muscle memory isn't, this is new, this is new. Again, feelings, gut feelings are data, but we don't usually use that data because if we follow that non-data, the nervous system's like, whoa, 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 like, what are you doing? I, I have nothing to use here. So I found first the relationship of certainty and intuition, but uncertainty in what will come, right? Like the not knowing, but leading with the knowing internally, the gut. It's funny because at first the nervous system is all over the place. Like it does not like you for that, <laughs> you know, it's, and then practice like everything, the nervous system starts to be like, oh, he's doing this again. I've seen you do that a few times. We'll be fine. It's like, almost like you have to trick your own nervous system and be like, oh, he's got a habit of not doing what I wanted to do and changing it up often. Now I'm used to change. And then I've been pairing that with Dr. Andrew Huberman's um, dopamine with dopamine of the journey versus dopamine of the destination. He didn't really paraphrase that that way, but that's pretty much what he was saying, right? Please excuse me if he's listening to this ever, but like- If you're listening, Andrew Huberman, please share this and come on the podcast. Yeah, there you go, exactly. We'd love to have a, a three conversation. There we go. Yeah, exactly. A, a three-way, we were going to say? Yeah, yeah. Not that kind, Dr. <laughs> Huberman. So- but he was, you know, he was talking about when we get so addicted to results, to goals, right? And you as an entrepreneur, you know this, and as a media creator and a content creator, and you know, you're responsible for millions of people, you know this. When we get so addicted to the goal, that's very fleeting. And we can get to the goal and we can tire ourselves just to get there. It lasts for a few minutes and we can crash even harder. And then sometimes you see this with athletes all the time after their career is over and they were riding a high for so long. And then all of a sudden they're like, wait, who am I without this identity? Right. And how do we end up embracing the journey and really enjoying the journey? And where it's the steps that feel so good in doing them and that we can actually create dopamine from doing these steps every single day, that the steps are now the dopamine and the result is actually like, I'm not even concerned about the result. Like you, in fact, you, re you achieve the result. And you're like, okay, like I'm just going to keep living and just keep going where it's one continuous journey and you're constantly, you know, where they say like, you know, the process is the journey and, and loving the, and embracing the process. And it wasn't until I got a little bit older that I started actually really, you know, dissecting that. I'm like, oh, that makes sense because we're creating dopamine of tapping in, feeling our intuition, feeling like what's right for us and knowing that we're, we're doing something that's in alignment with our soul. And so that's where I love bringing the soul in meets the science. And it's like, but the science is saying, yeah, because you're trusting yourself and you're doing the task every day and showing up for yourself, that's going to produce a level of dopamine that feels right. And that's not going to make you crash. And so I love mar marrying those two concepts together. And, and like, and it's funny because you can feel it and back to your point about distractions. Somebody tries to pull you out and you're like, that does not give me the dopamine hit anymore. 
this has given me. So the so the pain of staying the same actually like isn't producing the same dopamine anymore as the dopamine from the change. And that was like a game changer for me because I'm like, I'm addicted to now to the change. I'm like, oh, and I've tricked the nervous system in the mind, which by the way, still <laughs> can like mess with me because the human in us is like, hey, keep practicing, buddy. So <laughs> right. I like that overlay. That's an interesting overlay because is it in AA that they say it's about progress, not perfection? I think it's in AA. And what happens too, as you said, you have this biological soul-driven process as well that is saying, I feel good about myself every time I choose myself. I feel good about myself in each step and each step is a choice of orienting differently. And, you know, we get lost in the goal or the outcome because it feels so monumentous. And often our self-worth is attached to the outcome, which is the old way of orienting or a very normal way of orienting when we've turned down the volume on ourselves in order for belonging and group membership and acclaim and whatever. And, you know, I've been reflecting on my own experience. There was something that really called to my soul to talk about, and that was the birth of my work, talking about relationships and all the things. And I felt like no one was telling the truth about them, how hard they were, and that you're not a fucking failure because your relationship ends. Like, it might be the most brilliant, beautiful thing you've ever done in your life. You should not be outcast for that. What I noticed in the last, you know, after having relative success, then it was hard for me to pivot because my identity was now attached to this way or this subject. And, you know, you always get the mirror of the people then who are just your ego, who are like, stay in your lane, you know, that kind of internet trolls. People who want me to stay in a place to keep them comfortable with why they choose to follow me instead of them just unfollowing me because I'm not their bag anymore, which is, but it's amazing how much I still had won the prostitute archetype. Like I knew I could have employees help support them, support myself, live a reasonably good life. And then that prostitute archetype there of not deviating what the soul was calling. And I found myself the last couple of years sort of, now I'm emerging, but I found myself split, which in trauma, that's very much a thing to be split. And there has been a lot of collective trauma in the last three years. And I feel myself now emerging and coming home, but also having compassion for a thing I wasn't aware of that I still had this codependency that was instead of being between me and my partner or me and my parents or me and a friend was actually between me and the collective group of opinion of, you know, I don't know that our nervous systems were designed to hear what the fuck a million people think or 10,000 people think. It was like a couple hundred who are like, we're disappointed in you. You shouldn't have stolen bread, a baguette from the bakery. And you're like, all right, sorry about that. You know, but now it's like, wait, you don't agree with every single version of my ideology and I feel offended by you. So I'm just going to try to create a tribe to take you down. Like that for human physiology is, I mean, I think the birthplace of why it's so difficult to have nuance anymore. I think we have to bring it back which actually requires the dysregulation of the people who are modeling being the bridge. Oof, man, you got like four podcasts in there right there. <laughs> There's a <laughs> lot. I mean, those are all, all really great topics. And I know Dave Chappelle, I think it was like, what's in a name for when he was the Duke, the school of Duke Ellington or Duke Ellington school, and they were going to give him his name and he decided to do something a little bit different. And he talked about, the, Oh yeah. Yeah. I it's such a that. great, cause he talks about exactly what you're talking about and the nuance and that this moving out of the collective and into individuality and how more discourse creates connection, right? There's been many times where I struggled with, I don't want to be known for just one thing, especially since I'm more than one thing. And hence now even the second podcast I have, The Niche Is You, my personal podcast, like you have one, The Niche Is You or Niche, some people like to say niche, I, I go back and forth. With The Niche Is You was very much like, because everybody's looking for this external way to fit in and abide by the collective or with, it really starts with more like the titles and the statuses and well, I'm this. I'm this identity, therefore, like, you can understand me now. And it's like, well, you're more than one thing, really. And not how that's probably being used in the macro. <laughs> you're more than one thing in terms of, like, our gifts and our talents. And you're not a title or the status you are within a society. And like you, I, I didn't want to talk about just really any one thing. Um, it started off really with one of my bigger accounts from years ago when I first got into the whole Instagram game with HDF Magazine. 
which I just kind of left dormant. It's like hundred and some thousand <laughs> just sitting there. I was talking about business and spirituality a lot. And I loved that combination didn't really exist, but it was really because, well, we have a great relationship with ourselves and pretty much in anything we do, especially in business, it'll have a different leadership style. And then it turned into me talking about relationships because I went through divorce and I learned a lot about myself over the last eight years. Talk about the nuances, like especially on my Matt Gottesman account, when I talk about relationships, <laughs> like, wow, like, I mean, the comments in a, in a healthy way and the, in the, you know, in the let's discuss and, and I see that. And then sometimes I'll talk about some certain things within like entrepreneurship and it's like, is this thing on? <laughs> you know? yeah. and, 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 and you know what though? I'm okay. I'm okay with that. And I'll say, I'll tell you why, because I love talking about all the things I want to be known for. He's somebody who embraces his values of like, Hey, here are the things that I like to talk about. And I want to encourage you to do the same. And so I get people who ask all the time about their, you know, accounts are like, well, I'm a CPA, but I also am a painter and I also am a pianist. And I'm like, you should talk about all of it, you know? And interestingly enough, you don't know where that's going to lead to. And that actually shows trust too in a relationship in the community that you build online. Yeah, okay. Not everybody may relate to it. Of course not. It depends on where they're at in their journey. But for the most part, I have found it's almost like giving them permission to do whatever is right for themselves. Hence why I have the Substack called permissionless. It's like, you don't need the permission, but let me lead in a way that I'm giving that permission to you of like, do it your way and show everybody the things that mean something to you, all of the things you decide on what those are and allow that to develop into all kinds of avenues you might not have even thought of. You know, it's like, and weirdly enough, diversification is no longer just the revenue, you know, the revenue models. Now it's also like the things that we do, which by the way, can lead to multiple businesses and multiple opportunities or multiple collaborations or whatever. And so funny where it brings you when you don't even realize it because you're, you're just freely flowing. And like, these are the things I like, you know, I want to talk about. And uh, even if I'm become known for one particular area, like, you know, such as yourself, right? Well, yeah, that, that idea that I'm afraid to talk about this thing because it might remove me from something or I might lose something. You know, I, I think what I was frustrated with looking back is that, well, why did I throw or, or leap off the cliff previously to now find myself on the same, what feels like the, a similar cliff, maybe a bigger jump? What you said about trusting, because when I first wanted to talk about relationships, I remember a coach saying, you just have to trust. And you know, it's that thing of like, if you listen to the voice, it, it will become easier to trust, like easier to listen to. Like it, it's like we want the net to appear before we leap. But my thought process is that the, the net can't because actually part of the leaping is knowing the net might not appear, but trusting that it does. And I know this here, you know, and, but to know it in your heart is such a more beautiful, graceful, integrated I think that's why some of the criticism of conversations about words like soul or words like truth is that they are abstract, but so is the word love, you know, like love is abstract. No one can actually put in the language what true unconditional love feels like, because once you feel it, you'll know that there's no language. And I think that's the same thing about soul or truth or voice or healing or God or the universe is that it is this element of trust. And I like that you're overlapping biology with that because, you know, it's like when someone talks about the secret. Well, the secret was like you create a fucking vision board and on it is things you want and then they just appear in your life and life's great. That's the cynical sort of representation of it. And I think for cynics it is like, oh, it's more of this fucking cuckoo, you know, pie in the sky bullshit that is blah, blah, blah. I used to think that way. I mean, I was a pharmaceutical rep, so very much in the like linear science. I love clinical study. I still love science. I just think that there's a whole other aspect of, you know, it's like with DNA. We say 90, I think it's like 95% of DNA is junk DNA or 91. And it's like, just because humans don't know what it does doesn't mean it's junk. I think that's the arrogance of humanity again, you know? And knowing all of this, it's like, being connected to or trusting in, it's so liberating, but it does feel abstract. It does feel like, how do you walk someone towards that? 
I know you know Abraham Hicks. She says, or he or they or whatever, the spirit when channeled says words don't teach actions do. And I think that's true. Like you can know all this shit, but till you walk it and then you'll be like, hey, just leave. <laughs> you know, that's the fucking wild thing. And trusting that you don't know where shit's going to bring you. Like I didn't know that leaving that relationship would lead to a passion, which would lead to a conversation, which would lead to this conversation. Are prayers words or integration? And that's where I challenge a lot of people because I love my relationship with God. It's a very spiritual one. It's a very integrated one. It's a very soulful one. And while I love prayers, which I pray every morning, it's not from a mechanical prayer place, which we could easily do, but from a like, I'm going to tap in and really feel, you know, and connect and integrate. And then what am I learning? And then how am I applying it? into the doing. So I'm not just words. You're right. Everything is from the doing. And that's what I think where we get our real data. And it's so interesting too, because I, I've talked about this recently on my podcast and I was, I didn't talk about God for a very long time. You know, it was, it was more recent actually the last year and a half. And I love it because I have so many different people from so many faiths, all faiths, all cultures are like, I love the way you talk about it. I'm like, well, because we're not separate, you know? And I'm like, and I'm not trying to pinpoint a religion to say like, it's about your relationship with self, soul, God, you know, and connecting. And, and it's so interesting because I'll see how quickly as a human, we make things so complex. I see it all the time. So talk about trust. How am I building more trust with myself? is through these conversations. And it's so interesting how I'll check myself and I'll, I'll give you, I'll give a vulnerable experience. You know, I was experiencing something with, um, with an ex and I wasn't feeling like I was being prioritized, but this person had a lot going on, a lot going on. I'm sitting down at the countertop and I'm journaling. And I do a lot of like stream of conscious journaling. And I use that time to talk to God. I'm like, I want to express myself. Just listen. I know you already know. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. <laughs> you know, I'm like, it's again, I'm like negotiating with God as usual. You know, I'm like saying like, I already know, like, let me just preface this. You know, I can hear, a, I can <laughs> hear, a, one. right, right. I can hear. Yeah, exactly. I'm in I'm everything, but yeah, go ahead. I'm enjoying this. I'm smiling. <laughs> and I'm sitting there expressing myself about how I'm feeling, not feeling prioritized. And I'm going on this whole, like how it feels and I'm working through it. And I'm like, oh shit, is that how you feel? You know, and I was like, "Oh my God!" I was like, "And this is about me." And I was like, "And yet, you're always there for me. There isn't like, there's no judgment whether I leave or come back. You're always waiting. And when I come back, you weren't like, why didn't you prioritize me? There's no judgment. There's no nothing. Like, there's all this. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, if I'm prioritizing you, which is really prioritizing me, then it doesn't matter if somebody is or isn't prioritizing me. And if I prioritize you, which is prioritizing me." then the world at large will come where it makes sense. Those that will prioritize will just see how I prioritize me anyways. So it won't, there's nothing I have to do with the external, but spend this time in this loop of myself and my soul. And, you know, I'm like, wow. I was like, we make things so complex. And I, every time I, you know, or like I, I was, I was upset a couple months back. I was so upset, angry. And I'm, I'm kind of, you know, in my, my feels. And about 20 minutes later, I said to God, I'm like, Sorry for yelling. And I feel this like, yeah, that's okay. And I'm thinking, oh my God, that's forgiveness. I was like, of course it is. Of course it is. I'm like, you didn't flinch. You didn't take my projections. You didn't think anything else of me. You didn't judge. You didn't take it on as your own. That was on me. It had nothing to do with you. And I was like going through this whole thing. I'm like, that's unconditional love. That's forgiveness. Because you didn't even flinch. You're like, yeah, that's okay. And I'm thinking like, that's integration and in how we forgive. That's how we move on the outside world. That's how we receive other people, even if they're projecting you know, how we don't react. We're the space holder in that. But if I have a very strong relationship with myself, I'm also not absorbing that. I'm just in that moment, allowing them to be the human. And now, depending on the relationship, we don't ever have to be, you know, <laughs> this is where the discernment comes in. Like we may never like have another moment again, because, you know, they may not be somebody of more influence in your life. But at least in that moment, you're holding the space and not judging. Grace or they are somebody you're very connected to and you're still able to show up that way. But it's so interesting, the dichotomy between myself and soul and then like the human side, like integrating it into the human side. And it's, it's a practice. So everything, I mean, I know that we were going in a different direction earlier about like, it's really just doing, like if I'm only my words, if I'm only my prayers, if I'm only just talking about these things and, and reading every 
possible book or outcome. It's never the same as like, I'm going to try this and see what happens. Got my data, <laughs> you know? And then, so do you go right or left? Do you go up or down? I got my data. I'm so glad I, in this moment I got the data. Let me just think through this. Let me think through this and feel through this and take a step and just keep moving. And that movement builds momentum and that momentum builds trust, right? You, every time you make a move, I feel like you're trusting yourself more. So that's why it's so important to do the doing. That overlap is beautiful because I think that is that that coming back to or becoming part of the collective again, feeling like part of everything and having compassion for where things come from for other people. But as you said, having discernment, whether that's the kind of thing you want to be around or, you know, as you gain more data, and I think this is very much very human, is that we collect so much fucking data, but we don't actually change and then more data just piles up until it's so painful holding. I've said before that, you know, we're all fucking Yoda, just waiting for someone else to tell us that we are or to, as you, you know, you, you reference, give us permission to be brilliant, to be powerful, to have discernment. You know, I think when we maybe we're raised not to trust ourselves, then we seek other people to make decisions for us in our lives. And part of that coming back home is, making decisions for ourselves and using that data to make informed choices. And I remember hearing Richard Rohr say on Krista Tippett's podcast that the journey to the true self is the same as the journey to God in that if you find yourself, you find God. And if you find God, you'll find yourself. They're not separate. And yeah, I didn't really get that till I got it till I had to heal and continue, I think, to heal my relationship to the word God because I grew up Catholic. And so my relationship, it was hijacked, you know, and and then weaponized. And so I pushed away spirituality, uh, thinking it's all bad as opposed to a connection with it can be something that feels fluid and, and complementary. I uh, co-facilitate a men's group here. There's about 60 guys in this throughout the valley. And um, on occasion, we'll do events that get kind of capped off depending on the attendance. And we did one, there was about 30 guys in the room. It's going to be for like a yin yoga and you do like the breath of fire and all this other stuff. But as we're going around the room before we even did anything, we were talking about everybody's relationship with God and every religion, by the way, and faith you had in there. It was great. And they all had a pivotal, something happened in the childhood. It was like, well, this strict enforcement here, or like, you know, this happened in Sunday school or whatever. <laughs> it was such a multitude of leaving. And then the next question was, so how'd you find yourself back? And everybody had a different, really cool answer. It's a really great, it's a really great question to ask. And it was really interesting to see how everybody had this moment like where they tapped in or something happened that it could only have been God, like whatever it might've been that brought them back. And then the relationship carried forward and there was, a, you know, there was some healing, a lot of healing in there. There was a lot of different things, you know, like you said, it didn't make sense until then it all of a sudden made sense in that journey to self. Is it that in the journey to self, did they find God or in the journey to God, did they find self or is it really both one and the same, you know? So I, I love that you, you said that it's, it's so true. And then, you know, this idea too, of, as we get to that place, the self-regulated nature of us too, is grace is sitting on this other side of somebody else. And whether you agree with them or not on what they're saying, whether they're coming at you or just in general, what they're saying, not having to convince, not having to fight, not having to anything, stay in your knowing, but stay observant and a participant in that exchange without having to force, you know, an opinion or a win, right? And I remember right after my divorce, eight years ago, eight, almost nine years ago, I remember, uh, I think it was a rabbi that said to me, he's like, would you rather be right or righteous? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I was like, son of a, I was like, why, why do you guys deliver these like, you know, and, and he made me really think about it. And he was basically saying, you know, it's not going to matter if you're right in any given situation. And maybe often you are, you never know, like depending on your level of where you're at, you know, and how you're carrying yourself. He's like, but how you handle the people when you are involved in that situation speaks higher than whether or not you are right or wrong. And more often than not, even if you're right and someone's wrong, there's still contention. <laughs> you know, So like he was referencing, of course, with marriage for me. And he was like, listen, he's like, it doesn't matter if you were right a lot of times in your marriage. You know, that doesn't matter. He's like, because if you're right and she's wrong and there's somebody has to win and somebody has to lose, you both lose. Because it's not about somebody right being right and somebody being wrong. It's about like, how do you handle a situation to have a deeper meaning and understanding to move together from that dynamic of what you're both learning in any given moment or situation. And I was like, oof. Yeah, that's a, 
That's a hit. Yeah, that was a hit. <laughs> how did your divorce change you and, and how you orient to work and creativity and expression, all that stuff? And I know you've been through relationships since, so like maybe any of your relational endings. It's been a beautiful journey to m my home, to myself. Now it's, it's incredible, but the divorce was amicable, but it rocked me because I, I didn't come from divorce. I naively thought that the world operates the way my parents did. My parents been through, like, I mean, they went through things. Not that they stuck together and that they shouldn't have been together. They just had a, a Michael Jordan, Scotty Pippen relationship. Like they have been through shit and they just had this, like when my dad like lost everything, from a couple of wrong choices and business partners. And yet he still owned the integrity of like, he paid off the debt of the mistakes the partners made. But like my mom called it and he went into a very tough spot mentally. And I mean, guiltily, I mean, you're, you're 48, you've got a family, you've lost pretty much everything. My mother, instead of like, you know, in more modern times, like, well, I'm out, you know, not then, you know, my mother knew the man, he, she knew who he was. She's like, I need you to get back into your heart and get back in the fight because I know who you are. See, that dynamic, I, I, I'm both blessed that I got to see that as a standard. And then I was also a little naive to think that that's, wasn't that like how all relationships should be and they end up. <laughs> Wait, don't all people say that when things are hard? And not to sidetrack, but it was interesting because uh, somebody had recently told me how they went, they came from the opposite side where everybody, like not to trust anybody in relationship. And I said, yeah, but you know what? The funny part is, is I had the opposite where I trusted everybody in the relationship. And isn't it ironic that we both had to learn discernment. You had to learn that there are people to trust and that that's good because there are good people out there who are going to take care of you. Like, I mean, in, in being appropriate to you. And then I had to learn not everybody moves like me. <laughs> and so like, you know, so it was, it was an interesting dynamic, but my ex-wife, you know, God bless her for circumstances that are not you know, relevant, just leading two different lives, doctor and an entrepreneur, her being the doctor, and just coming to a place where, you know, the time was up and it was amicable, but I took it serious for me. And a few people in my circle were like, wow, you're, you're taking it very hard. Like, you know, there was two of you and I don't think you did that many things wrong. And, and I, you know, I don't, why are you being so hard on yourself? I'm like, it's not that I'm being hard on myself. It's that I'm now only responsible for myself. And without being responsible for her as part of the, the team, I have to dissect how I got here. It doesn't matter if I did something right or if I did something wrong. What matters is how did I get here? And so I'm looking at the man in the mirror and I'm wanting to know a little bit more about my decision making and how I got here so I can understand where am I going to go from here. And that started all of this mark that's actually how we're even here right now like literally this is so it's nine years of this journey first with the age so i went online and what really sparked it was um i was uh coming home from europe with my parents a little bit early we went as four we came home as three because she stayed behind for a little bit with her family and i remember my father was like you know which way do you think it's gonna go it's like it's 50 50 and he's like which 50 and i was like probably divorce you know and he was like okay and he's just like you know uh, he's like i love you and this is a New York, Bronx, New York lawyer. Um, not that he wasn't loving, he was a very loving man, but he doesn't normally talk, you know, where he starts off with like, I love you, you know, I love you, son. He was just like, but he's like, I love you. And I'm like, okay, this is going to be good. And he goes, I think you need to start running your race for you. I think that stop running everybody else's race. I think you really need to run your race. I think you need to do everything right by you for you and run it and never look back. I think you're out of time in terms of like how much more you'll do everything for everybody else. I think you need to really run your race. Stop running their race for them. And that really hit me so hard. So I came home and I took to the internet having conversations. And for a little while, I didn't, I think I played somewhat victim about the whole marriage concept and relationships because not victim like uh, women are this or, you know, nothing, nothing like that. Just, um, you know, women would ask like, oh, you ever want to get married again? I'm like, oh, you know, if, if God means it to be, if a wife and kids are in the, you know, in the cards, yeah, you know, we'll see. And I played it that, well, he already took it away. So I was kind of playing that card until I realized how wrong I was in terms of we can have whatever we want when we play with clarity and consistency, leadership, honesty, integrity, knowing, we have to know who we are and what we want. And it wasn't until my ex-girlfriend 
who's now one of my my bestest friends from five years ago when we dated, who and I was mentioning to you, I think before the podcast, that that really taught me to, well, first to get to her, I realized like, you know what? I do want a serious relationship that can lead to marriage. But I wasn't still yet, you know, I was still trying to figure out what is that that for me. And in this serious relationship, it, it taught me a lot about as a man, you know, I would say something. And how she approached me, no woman had ever approached me before. So some of our greatest feelings, I think, as men can come from strong, intuitive, knowing women who are not here to judge, but are here to stand in truth. Those women men need to find those ladies. They need to find those women. We usually, we usually run from those. You know, so and they're your greatest asset you could ever have. They're your mirror, they're your muse. They're like you run. You win championships with those type of women. And that turned me around because she would say stuff like, no, how are you really feeling? And I'd say, what do you mean? No, this is how I'm feeling. And I almost got, I would get flustered because I thought I knew how I was feeling. And she would say, no, how are you really feeling? Like, besides the fact that this is also her job, um, not as a psychologist, well, she's a spiritual psychologist, but she would like, no, she could feel, she could feel everybody's stuff. So she'd be like, no, she'd be like, what are you really feeling? And I would take a moment, I'd take some of those five hours or, you know, several hours or a day. And when I come back and I tell her, and it could be an insecurity, it could be an, a realization, it could be anything that's at my core truth. She was like, thank you. And I'm like, and I told you before the podcast, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> I was like, have I been like a wavering man? Have I been confusing? Have I been a confusing man to women at times? Because as we talked about, like women know, they just know their, their intuition is so spot on. Even if we don't know ourselves, which is why I think men can get defensive a lot of times, because if we're not clear, we can get defensive. But when we're clear, we're like, no, actually, this is how I feel. You know, <laughs> like you, 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 like you really, really know. We, she approached me, said several months in, you know, listen, I don't think you're my life partner. There's something at the soul level. So she taught me that truth too. And she's like, but I don't want to stall you if, you know, you're a little bit older than me. And I want to, I want to make sure that I'm not, she handled me with actual unconditional love and truth and honesty. And that taught me you know, she said, I don't want to, I don't want to block you from what's for you. You know, I'm not in a rush. I mean, we can stay together, but there's also, there has to be an end date at some point, you know, and we can either do that now and just be friends or, you know, later on. And, and so we did it for a little while, you know, we stayed that that way for about almost two years. And, um, and then we made the beautiful, you know, separation of like, no, you know what? It was great because we spent a year after that of friendship and not we didn't really tell too many people in the community because we lead very private lives and none of us, neither of us wanted to date, you know? And so it was about a year afterwards that she made such a pivotal role in me getting the clearest I've ever been to date, which is, she's like, sweetheart, I love you. She's like, I know you know what you want, but you have to get in the game and play with God to make it happen. You can't just know what you want. That's great that you've come to this place where you're like, you know, okay, like marriage, children, like, you own it. Like you own it very well. She's like, now play it very well. And I was like, damn, like, <laughs> like and it hit me so. Yeah, the choices have to Yeah, she's like, get in the game, integrate, play, show God, show up so you can receive. And it was interesting because my relationship with women had changed and they were, they looked at me like, wow, like that man knows what he wants. He's very clear. Like I either you know, shit or get off the pot because like he is like beelining for the life that he's creating. I was, I was clear. I was very, very clear without judging them just the same too. And it was interesting to actually see, I'm like, wow, like, so I'm now seeing what women were going through with men as a man. I'm seeing like, I'm going through it with women. Some of the women actually had a hard time in the beginning. The first ones I've I met had a hard time talking about marriage and children. And I remember one kind of freaked out when I first brought up. She's like, oh, oh, I, you know, if, if it's meant to be, I'm like, there, what happened? Who was the guy? Who were the men? And it was cool. It was very, it was funny. A uh, coffee date turned into a coaching session. <laughs> so, you know, I was like, hey, what, like, what happened was very interesting is I said, well, okay, you know, what happened in your last relationship? We knew, we each knew the same person. And she's like, well, you know, he was this. And, you know, she was in her mid thirties. He was in his late twenties. I'm like, well, okay. And I was like, well, what do you want? And she goes, well, you know, I want this. And I was like, oh, okay. You want this? And she goes, yeah. And I'm like, what does he want? And she's like, I had never really thought about that. And I'm like, so you know what you want, but you haven't thought about what a man like that wants? And she's like, no, I hadn't. I was like, okay. I'm like, something to think about. I was like, and do you know your needs? 
Do you know your values? Do you know? And I was like, when I say needs, not your material needs, <laughs> like needs like, oh, I like a spiritual home or, you know, one where we do maybe activities that are in alignment with, you know, betterment of health and mindset or whatever, you know, or, or needs of like somebody that can communicate and you have, you know, no matter what, honest communication, like, do you know your needs? And she's like, I guess I thought I did, but you know, maybe I should write them down. I'm like, that's one of the greatest things you can do, you know, write them down, know what your values are and practice them yourself. Poof, they'll show up. I promise you. So it was interesting when I got back out there. And then, you know, I'd, I'd had a couple of relationships that were very beautiful and loving, looking for the same things. Only it was just that practice of like, oh, I think somewhere at the soul level, maybe we just not might be that partner. But there was so much love and respect. And it was interesting. I actually had a very, you know, kind of a final realization for anybody listening to this about, um, it's very interesting how where we started this conversation you can actually, you know, you can have a great relationship on paper and in person and in, in all things. Like there's a lot of alignment, really two good souls met. Doesn't mean that that has to be your partner. Now, a lot of people who've really dated not so good people, they get into one good relationship, they're like, this has to work. And like, whoa, 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 now you're dating in a better pool. Yeah, you're like, no, 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 now you're dating in a better pool. Now keep playing in that pool, whether that is the one or from that pool. But one thing that struck me that was really interesting in a relationship was, we had a hard time letting each other go because we liked each other so much. Yes, we absolutely loved each other. So yeah, so what I had found in two, you know, here we are, two souls, good relationship. Everything feels good in terms of values and alignment, direction, all the things that we want, just that we're not necessarily for each other. But the directness was there. And there was a really great lesson that came up that I'd never found before for myself. And it's definitely something I would I love sharing with others because we don't even realize that we can do this. There was a couple of times that um, there was one or two particular subjects that she would bring up to me and it would trigger because I knew that it wasn't me. But like, it just so happened, it happened to be something that I was also very defensive about, not because it's not just because it's not me, but because also just that thing, that narrative that we can sometimes have, like, see, you know, you know, when a woman brings that up, you know, and it was a very interesting observation. We get through the conversation. We actually, we were always very good about leaning in. We get through the conversation. I sensed it was not done. And then months later, it came up again. And it was, I thought that was, that had finally cleared it up. And then finally, towards the end of our relationship, when it came up, I remember She's like, I know you don't want me to say this, but this is where, you know, I'm still hung up on this thing and I'm listening. And during that moment, I'm asking God, I'm like, you know what? Work through me. I don't want to respond the way my human does. Work through me. I let her finish without even wanting to interrupt. The defensiveness in me is gone. And out of nowhere, when she's done, she's like, you seem very calm. And I'm like, you're not my life partner. And she's like, oh, and there was this relief. And I was like, We've already talked that we weren't, we teetered. We had talked about like, you know, we both felt in the soul. We couldn't let go. You are not my life partner. And let me explain. And she said, what's that? And I said, you and I both know that's not true about me. I know it's not true about me. And in the past I was triggered and I came at it from a very defensive place for a lot of different reasons. But we both know because, and I was mentioning to her, I said, recently you had spoken about online the exact opposite of that, because you know in your soul that it could actually be the thing that you're, you know, and for respect, I'm not gonna say what the issue was. I was like, but you had basically said that like, it doesn't matter, that that thing didn't matter. And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, exactly. I was like, I'm having a realization here. And she says, what's that? And I said, we can't let each other go and we have to. So instead what we're doing is we're making a list and that's what people do. They make lists like you do this, you do that, you do this, you do this, you do all these things. Like we, people make lists on each other when they need something to justify the fact that we're just not meant for each other. Now, this is different than like, you know, you know, you get in the nuances of a marriage that's going many years and there's little complaints here and there. And, you know, you're just trying to figure it out. You know, I mean, Kobe and Shaq fought all the time. They still won championships, right? But this was different. This was like, oh, wow. I'm like, you see this in relationships all the time. Like, well, he does this and she does that. And he did like, you're using all of these lists to actually remove the really good that brought you two together in the first place. And probably quite frankly, lasted for a good little while. You may just not be for each other. And instead of just actually all the way back to the beginning of the podcast, being honest and saying, you know what, we may just not be each other's life partner for the whole rest of the way. And because of that, instead, 
how can I find little things to almost make me want to not be with you versus the actual of like, maybe we're not supposed to be together and we could just actually love each other and help each other go in the direction of where we're supposed to go. Like that Ram Das always comes to me about the like, you know, we're all just walking each other home. Okay, why don't we all just walk each other home? Why don't we actually as men and women, you know, help each other and like either I'm for you or the time with you will be helpful to you for where you're heading. And why can't we just treat each other like that? Why can't that be the way we handle relationships where it's like, hey, you know, we have these conversations up front. Are we aligned? And do we feel the feels? And are we going to do this dance? And if we're going to do this dance, can we just agree to treat each other with respect and care and like doing the right thing? And we don't need lists to look at all the nitpicky little things that don't align. We need to just feel through this and feel, are we really feeling what we're really feeling here? Is this where I think it's really going? And if it's not, can we also voice ourselves and help each other and like make sure that we take care of each other in that dance? I think we would have a lot more graceful relationships, beginnings, lastings, exits, all of it, right? And so it was just interesting when the whole list thing came out. I'm like, wow, God just worked through. I'm like, we're trying to make a list. Because I used to always try to think of things. For, I was like, I have a list on you. And I was like, but they don't bother me as much because I really enjoyed my time with you. And I was like, so that's why I've never really brought it up. And she's like, that's fair. And I was like, right. You know, and then of course, you know, being amicable after that. And I remember months later, you know, every now and then she'd call and she's like, wow, you know, I just had this realization. I had to share this with you. And she was sharing about her, her newest relationship. And you trust and respect somebody more when they're just being so honest with you. And we're not trying to tear each other down in the process, but actually help each other out for each other or for where we're going. And so I realized that it's not about a list. Why remove all the good that you already have? That was a great realization. And since then, it's just about playing solely from the soul, being completely aligned, not trying to go out of integrity with what, you know, if I know it, I hear it. No, do it, which is a lot of practice, but it's worth it. That is definitely a lot of practice because that's the trusting of it. And, you know, I think when we tell the truth, we just exhale because it's already present. We already know it's there. Sometimes we're resistant to it. It's like, you know, that idea of if I see my partner or anyone in my life walking me home, if I've avoided home or I've avoided the pain of not feeling at home, then when someone else chooses something that we both know to be true, it can be very confronting because then we're being called back into integrity and it's easier to blame them or try to get them to us to both collude together in being smaller. I think most relationships are that till they're not. When they're not, then all of a sudden you're like, wow, I can't go back to the old kind. And like you said, your dating pool gets smaller and that's not a problem. That's actually evidence of the work. Uh, Matt, I could talk to you for hours. I mean, this is, <laughs> I love chatting with you. I love your insights. I love the way your mind works. I love the way your heart works. I love the overlap of bringing in science with soul. I mean, it's just all, it's, it's also delicious. I like that word for it. That's a good word. Such a good word. Thank you for having me. This was a good exchange. I'm looking forward to more too. 